Act One of Alice in Wonderland by Alice Gernstenberg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene One Alice's Home. Lewis Carroll is discovered playing chess. Golden haired Alice in a little blue dress, a black kitten in her arms, stands watching him. That's a funny game, Uncle. What did you do then? A red pawn took a white pawn. This way, you see, Alice? The chessboard is divided into 64 squares, red and white, and the white army tries to win, and the red army tries to win. It's like a battle. With soldiers? Yes. Here are the kings and queens they are fighting for. That's the red queen, and here's the white queen. How funny they look. See the crowns on their heads, and look at their big feet. It's a foot apiece, that's what it is. Do they hump along like this? Here, you're spoiling the game. You must keep them in their right squares. I want to be a queen. Here you are. He points to a small white pawn. Here you are, in your little stiff skirt. How do you do, Alice? And now you are going to move here. Let me move myself. When you travel all along the board this way, and you haven't been taken by the enemy, you may be a queen. Why do people always play with kings and queens? Mother has them in her playing cards, too. Look. Alice goes to the mantel and takes a pack of playing cards from the ledge. Here's the king of hearts, and here's his wife. She's the queen of hearts. Isn't she cross-looking? Wants to bite one's head off. Carol moves a pawn. You're playing against yourself, aren't you? That's one way of keeping in practice, Alice. I have friends in the university who want to beat me. But if you play against yourself, I should think you'd want to cheat. Does a nice little girl like you cheat when she's playing against herself? Oh, I never do. I'd scold myself hard. I always pretend I'm two people, too. It's lots of fun, isn't it? Sometimes, when I'm all alone, I walk up to the looking-glass and talk to the other Alice. She's so silly, that Alice. She can't do anything by herself. She just mocks me all the time. When I laugh, she laughs. When I point my finger at her, she points her finger at me. And when I stick my tongue out at her, she sticks her tongue out at me. Kitty has a twin, too, haven't you, darling? Alice goes to the mirror to show Kitty her twin. I'll have to write a book some day about Alice. Alice in Wonderland, child of the pure, unclouded brow and dreaming eyes of wonder. Or Alice through the Looking Glass. Don't you wish sometimes you could go into Looking Glass House? See? Alice stands on an armchair and looks into the mirror. There's the room you can see through the glass. It's just the same as our living room here, only the things go the other way. I can see all of it. All but the bit just behind the fireplace. Oh, I do wish I could see that bit. I want so much to know if they've a fire there. You never can tell, you know, unless our fire smokes. Then smoke comes up in that room, too. But that may be just to make it look as if they had a fire, just to pretend they had. The books are something like our books, only the words go the wrong way. Won't there ever be any way of our getting through, Uncle? Do you think Kitty would find looking-glass milk digestible? It doesn't sound awful good, does it? But I might leave her at home. She's been into an awful lot of mischief today. She found sister's knitting and chased the ball all over the garden where sister was playing croquet with the neighbours. And I ran and ran after the naughty little thing until I was all out of breath and so tired. I am tired. She yawns and makes herself comfortable in the armchair. Carol replaces the playing cards on the mantel and consults his watch. Take a nap. Yes, you have time before tea. We're going to have mock turtle soup for supper. I heard Mamma tell the cook not to pepper it too much. What a funny little rabbit it is, nibbling all the time. He leans gently over the back of her chair, and seeing that she is going to sleep, puts out the lamp light and leaves the room. A red glow from the fireplace illumines Alice. Dream music. 
A bluish light reveals the red chess queen and the white chess queen in the mirror. The red queen points to Alice and says in a mysterious voice, There she is. Let's call her over. Do you think she'll come? I'll call softly. Alice. Hist! Alice! Alice! Hush! If she wakes and catches us. Alice, Alice come, come through, through into, looking, into, glass into house. looking glass house. Their hands beckon her. Alice rises and talks sleepily. The queens disappear. Alice climbs from the arm of the chair to the back of another, and so on, up to the mantel edge, where she picks her way daintily between the vases. I don't know how I can get through. I've tried before, but the glass was hard, and I was afraid of cutting my fingers. She feels the glass and is amazed to find it like gauze. Why, it's soft like gauze. It's turning into a sort of mist. Why, it's easy to get through. Why, why, I'm going through. She disappears. Scene 2. Is scene 1 reversed? The portiers are black and red squares like a chessboard. A soft radiance follows the characters mysteriously. As the curtain rises, Alice comes through the looking glass, steps down, looks about in wonderment, and goes to see if there is a fire. The Red Queen rises out of the grate and faces her haughtily. Why, you're the Red Queen! Of course I am. Where do you come from, and where are you going? Look up, speak nicely, and don't twiddle your fingers. I only wanted to see what the looking glass was like. Perhaps I've lost my way. I don't know what you mean by your way. All the ways about here belong to me. Curtsy while you're thinking what to say. It saves time. I'll try it when I go home. The next time I'm a little late for dinner. It's time for you to answer now. Open your mouth a little wider when you speak, and always say, Your Majesty. I suppose you don't want to lose your name? No, indeed. And yet I don't know. Only think how convenient it would be if you could manage to go home without it. For instance, if the governess wanted to call you to your lessons, she would call out, Come here! And there she would have to leave off, because there wouldn't be any name for her to call, and of course she wouldn't have to go, you know. That would never do, I'm sure. The governess would never think of excusing me from lessons for that. If she couldn't remember my name, she'd call me Miss, as the servants do. Well, if she said Miss and didn't say anything more, of course you'd miss your lessons. I dare say you can't even read this book. It's all in some language I don't know. Why, it's a looking-glass book, of course. And if I hold it up to a glass, the words will all go the right way again. Jabberwocky, twas brillig and the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the burrow goes, and the moam wraiths outgrabe. It seems very pretty, but it's rather hard to understand. Somehow it seems to fill my head with ideas, only I don't exactly know what they are. I dare say you don't know your geography either. Look at the map. She takes a right-angle course to the portiers and points to them with her scepter. It's marked out just like a big chessboard. I wouldn't mind being a pawn, though of course I should like to be a red queen best. That's easily managed. When you get to the eighth square, you'll be a queen. It's a huge game of chess that's being played all over the world. Come on, we've got to run. Faster, don't try to talk. I can't. Faster, faster. Are we nearly there? Nearly there? Why, we passed it ten minutes ago. Faster! You may rest a little now. Why, I do believe we're in the same place. Everything's just as it was. Of course it is. What would you have it? Well, in our country, you generally get to somewhere else, if you ran very fast for a long time as we've been doing. A slow sort of country. Now here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. I'd rather not try, please. I'm quite content to stay here, only I am so hot and thirsty. I know what you'd like. She takes a little box out of her pocket. Have a biscuit? Alice, not liking to refuse, 
curtsies as she takes the biscuit and chokes. While you're refreshing yourself, I'll just take the measurements. She takes a ribbon out of her pocket and measures the map with it. At the end of two yards, I shall give you your directions. Have another biscuit? No, thank you. One's quite enough. Thirst quenched, I hope? At the end of three yards, I shall repeat them, for fear of your forgetting them. At the end of four, I shall say good-bye, and at the end of five, I shall go. That square belongs to Humpty Dumpty, and that square to the Griffin and Mock Turtle, and that square to the Queen of Hearts. But you make no remark? I... I didn't know I had to make one, just then. You should have said, it's extremely kind of you to tell me all this. However, we'll suppose it said, four, goodbye, five. Red Queen vanishes in a gust of wind behind the portiers. Rabbit music. White Rabbit comes out of the fireplace and walks about the room hurriedly. He wears a checked coat, carries white kid gloves in one hand, a fan in the other, and takes out his watch to look at it anxiously. Oh, the Duchess! Oh, the Duchess! Oh, won't she be savage if I've kept her waiting? I've never seen a rabbit with a waistcoat and a watch, and a waistcoat pocket, if you please, sir. Oh! He drops fan and gloves in fright and dashes out by way of the portiers in a gust of wind. Alice picks up the fan and playfully puts on the gloves. The portiers flap in a breeze and the shawl flies in. Alice catches the shawl and looks about for the owner, then meets the White Queen. I'm very glad I happened to be in the way. The White Queen runs in wildly, both arms stretched out wide as if she were flying, and cries in a helpless, frightened way. Bread and butter! Bread and butter! Am I addressing the White Queen? Well, yes, if you call that a dressing. It isn't my notion of the thing at all. If your majesty will only tell me the right way to begin, I'll do it as well as I can. But I don't want it done at all. I've been addressing myself for the last two hours. Every single thing's crooked, and you're all over pins. May I put your shawl straight for you? I don't know what's the matter with it. It's out of temper. I've pinned it here and I've pinned it there, but there's no pleasing it. It can't go straight, you know, if you pin it all on one side. And dear me, what a state your hair is in! The brush has got entangled in it, and I lost the comb yesterday. Alice takes out a brush and arranges the Queen's hair. You look better now, but really you should have a lady's maid. I'm sure I'll take you with pleasure. Tuppence a week and jam every other day. I don't want you to hire me, and I don't care for jam. It's very good, jam. Well, I don't want any today, at any rate. You couldn't have it if you did want it. The rule is, jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, but never jam today. It must come sometimes to jam today. No, it can't. It's jam every other day. Today isn't any other day, you know. I don't understand you. It's dreadfully confusing. That's the effect of living backwards. It always makes one a little giddy at first. Living backwards? I never heard of such a thing. But there's one great advantage in it, that one's memory works both ways. I'm sure mine only works one way. I can't remember things before they happen. It's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards. What sort of things do you remember best? Oh, things that happened the week after next. For instance, now. She sticks a large piece of plaster on her finger. There's the king's messenger. He's in prison being punished, and the trial doesn't even begin till next Wednesday. And, of course, the crime comes last of all. Suppose he never commits the crime. The White Queen binds the plaster with ribbon. That would be all the better, wouldn't it? Of course it would be all the better. But it wouldn't be all the better his being punished. You're wrong there, at any rate. Were you ever punished? Only for faults. And you were all the better for it, I know. Yes, but then I had done the things I was punished for. That makes all the difference. But if you hadn't done them, that would have been better still. Better and better and better. There's a mistake somewhere. 
The white queen screams like an engine whistle and shakes her hand. Oh, oh my finger's bleeding. Oh. What is the matter? Have you pricked your finger? I haven't pricked it yet, but I soon shall. Oh. When do you expect to do it? When I fasten my shawl again. The brooch will come undone directly. Oh. Brooch flies open and she clutches it wildly. Take care! You're holding it all crooked. The White Queen pricks her finger and smiles. That accounts for the bleeding, you see. Now you understand the way things happen here. But why don't you scream now? Why, I've done all the screaming already. What would be the good of having it all over again? Oh, it's time to run if you want to stay in the same place. Come on! No, no, not so fast. I'm getting dizzy. Everything's black before my eyes. There is music, and the sound of rushing wind, and in the darkness the White Queen cries. Faster! Faster! Alice gasps. I can't. Please stop. And the Queen replies. Then you can't stay in the same place. I'll have to drop you behind. Faster! Faster! Goodbye! Scene 3 when the curtain rises, one sees nothing but old black lanterns with orange lights, hanging presumably from the sky. The scene lights up slowly, revealing Alice seated on two large cushions. She has been dropped behind by the White Queen, and is dazed to find herself in a strange hall with many peculiar doors and knobs, too high to reach. Oh, my head! Where am I? Oh, dear! Oh, dear! She staggers up and to her amazement finds herself smaller than the table. I've never been smaller than any table before. I've always been able to reach the knobs. What a curious feeling. Oh, I'm shrinking. It's the fan. The gloves. She throws them away, feels her head, and measures herself against the table and doors. Oh, saved in time. But I never, never. Oh, my fan and gloves. Where are I? Oh, Mr. Rabbit, please help me out. I want to go home. I want to go home. Oh, the Duchess. Oh, my fur and whiskers. She'll get me executed, as sure as ferrets are ferrets. Oh, you have them. I'm sorry. You dropped them, you know. The White Rabbit picks up fan and gloves and patters off. She'll chop off your head. If you please, sir. Where am I? Won't you please tell me how to get out? I want to get out. The white rabbit looks at his watch. Oh, my ears and whiskers. How late it's getting. A trap door gives way and rabbit disappears. Alice dashes after only in time to have the trap door bang in her face. It's a rabbit hole. I'm small enough to fit it too. If I shrink any more, it might end in my going out altogether like a candle. I wonder what I would be like then. What does the flame of a candle look like after the candle is blown out? I've never seen such a thing. Humpty Dumpty sits on a wall. Don't stand chattering to yourself like that, but tell me your name and your business. My name is Alice, but... It's a stupid name enough. What does it mean? Must a name mean something? Of course it must. My name means the shape I am, and a good handsome shape it is, too. With a name like yours, you might be any shape, almost. You're Humpty Dumpty, just like an egg. It's very provoking to be called an egg. Very. I said you looked like an egg, sir, and some eggs are very pretty, you know. Some people have no more sense than a baby. Why do you sit here all alone? Why, because there's nobody with me. Did you think I didn't know the answer to that? Ask another. Don't you think you'd be safer down on the ground? That wall's so very narrow. What tremendously easy riddles, you ask? Of course I don't think so. Take a good look at me. I'm one that has spoken to a king, I am. And to show you I'm not proud, you may shake hands with me. He leans forward to offer Alice's hand, but she is too small to reach it. 
However, this conversation is going on a little too fast. Let's go back to the last remark, but one. I'm afraid I can't remember it. In that case, we start fresh, and it's my turn to choose the subject. You talk about it just as if it were a game. So here's a question for you. How old did you say you were? Seven years and six months. Wrong! You never said a word about it! Now, if you'd asked my advice, I'd have said leave off at seven, but... I never ask advice about growing. Too proud? What a beautiful belt you've got on. At least, a beautiful cravat, I should have said. No, a belt, I mean. I beg your pardon. If only I knew which was neck and which was waist. Oh, it is a most provoking thing when a person doesn't know a cravat from a belt. I know it's very ignorant of me. It's a cravat, child, and a beautiful one, as you say. There's glory for you. I don't know what you mean by glory. When I use the word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is whether you can make words mean different things. The question is which is to be master. That's all. Impenetrability! That's what I say. Would you tell me, please, what that means? I meant by impenetrability that we've had enough of that subject, and it would be just as well if you'd mention what you meant to do next, as I suppose you don't mean to stop here all the rest of your life. That's a great deal to make one word mean. When I make a word do a lot of work like that, I always pay it extra. Oh! Ah, oh, you should see em come round me of a Saturday night. For to get their wages, you know. That's all. Goodbye. Goodbye, till we meet again. I shouldn't know you again if we did meet. You're so exactly like other people. The face is what one goes by generally. That's just what I complain of. Your face is the same as everybody has. The two eyes, so, nose in the middle, mouth under. It's always the same. Now, if you had the two eyes on the same side of the nose, for instance, or the mouth at the top, that would be some help. It wouldn't look nice. Wait till you've tried. Goodbye. He disappears as he came. Oh, I forgot to ask him how to... She tries to open the doors. They are all locked. She begins to weep. She walks weeping to a high glass table and sits down on its lower ledge. She sits on a big golden key and picks it up in surprise. She tries it on all the doors, but it does not fit. She weeps and weeps, and Wonderland grows dark to her in her despair. In the darkness she cries, Oh, I'm slipping! Oh, oh, it's a lake! Oh, my tears! I'm floating! A mysterious light shows a drink-me sign around a bottle on the top of the table. Alice floats up to it, panting, and holding on to the edge of the table, takes up the bottle. It isn't marked poison. She sips at it. This is good. Tastes like cherry tart, custard, pineapple, roast turkey, toffee, and hot butter toast, all together. Oh, oh, I'm letting out like a telescope. A mysterious light shows her lengthening out. Music. But the lake is rising too. Oh, oh, it's deep. I'm drowning. Help, help, I'm drowning. I'm drowning in my tears. Yeesker. Yeesker. The griffin, a huge green creature with big glittering wings, appears where Humpty Dumpty had been and reaches glittering claws over to grab and save Alice. Scene 4 is symbolic of a wet and rocky shore in a weird green light. The mock turtle is weeping dismally. Yeesker. 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 The mock turtle answers with his weeping. <laughs> the griffin drags Alice in. Drop your tears into the sea with his. He sobs as if he had a bone in his throat. He sighs as if his heart would break. What is his sorrow? Oh, griffin, it's terrible. It's all his fancy, that. Mock Turtle hasn't got no sorrow. This here young lady, 
she wants for to know your history she do i'll tell her to sit down both of you and don't speak a word till i've finished i don't see how you can ever finish if you don't begin once i was a real turtle <laughs> A long silence is broken only by the exclamations of the griffin and the heavy sobbing of the mock turtle. <laughs> when we were little, we went to school in the sea. The master was an old turtle. We used to call him Tortoise. Why did you call him Tortoise, if he wasn't one? We called him Tortoise because he taught us. Really, you are very dull. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for asking such a simple question. Rive on, old fellow. Don't be all day about it. Yes, we went to school in the sea, though you mayn't believe it. I never said I didn't. You did. Hold your tongue. We had the best of educations. In fact, we went to school every day. I've been to a day school too. You needn't be so proud as all that. With extras? Yes, we learned French and music. And washing? Certainly not. Ah, then yours wasn't a really good school. Now at ours we had at the end of the bill French, music, and washing. Extra! You couldn't have wanted it much, living at the bottom of the sea. I couldn't afford to learn it. I only took the regular course. What was that? Reeling and writhing, of course, to begin with, and then the different branches of arithmetic, ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. I never heard of uglification. What is it? Never heard of uglifying? You know what to beautify is, I suppose. Yes, it means to make anything prettier. Well, then, if you don't know what to uglify is, you are a simpleton. What else had you to learn? Well, there was mystery, mystery, ancient and modern, with seography, then drawling. The drawling master was an old conger eel. It used to come once a week. What he taught us was drawling, stretching, and fainting in coils. What was that like? Well, I can't show it you myself. I'm too stiff. And the griffin never learned it. Hadn't time. I went to the classical master, though. He was an old crab, he was. I never went to him. He taught laughing and grief, they used to say. So he did. So he did. And how many hours a day did you do lessons? Ten hours the first day, nine the next, and so on. What a curious plan! That's the reason they're called lessons. Because they lessen from day to day. Then the eleventh day must have been a holiday. Of course it was. And how did you manage on the twelfth? That's enough about lessons. Tell us something about the games now. Mock Turtle sighs deeply, draws back one flapper across his eyes. He looks at Alice and tries to speak, but sobs choke his voice. <sighs> Griffin punches him on the back. Same as if he had a bone in his throat. The Mock Turtle with tears running down his cheeks. You may not have lived much under the sea. 
I haven't. And perhaps you were never even introduced to a lobster. I once tasted... No, never. So you can have no idea what a delightful thing a lobster quadrille is. No, indeed. What sort of a dance is it? Why, you first form into a line along the seashore. Two lines. Seals, turtles, salmon, and so on. Then when you've cleared all the jellyfish out of the way... That generally takes some time. You advance twice. Each with a lobster as a partner. Of course, advance twice set to partners. Change lobsters and retire in same order. Then, you know, you throw the... The lobsters! As far out to sea as you can. <laughs> Swim after them. Turn a somersault in the sea. Change lobsters again. Back to land again. And that's all the first figure. It must be a very pretty dance. Would you like to see a little of it? Very much indeed. Come, let's try the first figure. We can do it without the lobsters, you know. Which shall sing? Oh, you sing. I've forgotten the words. Creatures solemnly dance round and round Alice, treading on her toes, waving forepaws to mark time while Mock Turtle sings. Will you walk a little faster, said a whiting to a snail. There's a porpoise clear behind us, and he's treading on my tail. See how eagerly the lobsters and the turtles all advance. They are waiting on the shingle. Will you come and join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you, will you join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you, won't you join the dance? You can really have no notion how delightful it will be when they take us up and throw us with the lobsters out to sea but the snail replied too far too far and gave a look askance said he thanked the whiting kindly but he would not join the dance would not, could not, would not, could not, would not join the dance. Would not, could not, would not, could not, could not join the dance. The creatures dance against Alice, pushing her back and forth between them. She protests and finally escapes. They bump against each other. Thank you. It's a very interesting dance to watch. And I do so like that curious song about the whiting. Oh, as to the whiting, they... You, you've seen them, of course. Yes, I've often seen them at Din... Checks herself hastily. Well, I don't know where Din may be, but if you've seen them so often, of course, you know what they're like. I believe so. They have their tails in their mouths, and they're all over crumbs. You're wrong about the crumbs. Crumbs would all wash off in the sea. But they have their tails in their mouths, and the reason is... Mock Turtle yawns and shuts his eyes. <sighs> Tell her about the reason and all that. The reason is that they would go with the lobsters to the dance. So they got thrown out to sea, so they had to fall a long way, so they got their tails fast in their mouths, so they couldn't get them out again. That's all. Thank you. It's very interesting. I never knew so much about whiting before. I can tell you more than that if you like. Do you know why it's called a whiting? I never thought about it. Why? 
does the boots and shoes? Does the boots and shoes? Why, what are your shoes done with? I mean, what makes them so shiny? They are done with blacking, I believe. Boots and shoes under the sea are done with whiting. Now you know. And what are they made of? Soles and ewes, of course. Any shrimp could have told you that. If I'd been the whiting, I'd have said to the porpoise, Keep back, please. We don't want you with us. They were obliged to have him with them. No wise fish would go anywhere without a porpoise. Wouldn't it really? Of course not. Why, if a fish came to me and told me he was going on a journey, I should say, with what porpoise? Don't you mean purpose? I mean what I say. Shall we try another figure of the lobster quadrille? Or would you like the mock turtle to sing you a song? Oh, a song, please, if the mock turtle would be so kind. Um, no accounting for tastes. Sing her turtle soup, would you, old fellow? The mock turtle sighs deeply and sometimes choked with sobs, sings. Beautiful soup, so rich and green, waiting in a hot tureen. Oh, for such dainties would not stoop. Soup of the evening, beautiful soup. Soup of the evening, beautiful soup. Beautiful soup, beautiful soup, soup of the evening. Beautiful, beautiful soup. The white rabbit enters, stretching out a red and white checked sash with which he separates Alice from the creatures. Check. They won't let her stay in our square. The queen is coming this way. She'll chop our heads off. Come on, come on, let's fly. The mock turtle and the griffin grab Alice and fly into the air. Curtain. The curtain rises to reveal small silhouettes of the griffin, mock turtle, and Alice in an orange-colored moon far away in the sky. Down below, the white rabbit is shouting to them, You'll be safe in the March Hare's garden! Curtain. End of Act One.